Hey, investing friends, it's time for our May update of our $123,000 TFSA dividend stock portfolio. In this video, we share our 20 holdings and which stocks we bought. Stay until the end to see the three new stocks we added to the portfolio. Let's do this. For the newbies to the channel, my wife and I do our finances together. We have three accounts through two brokerages for our TFSA, Scotia iTrade and Wellsimple. The month of May was pretty flat for us, while the NASDAQ and S&P 500 are rocking it. We finished May up 0.5%, or $600. This really lagged the NASDAQ, which was up 6%. As you can see in our Wealthica account, we're sitting at 1.8% year-to-date performance. It's not terrible beating the TSX and Dow Jones. However, in comparison to tech, the portfolio is getting killed. The NASDAQ is up 23.6% year-to-date and the S&P 500, just over 9%. Mind you, it is a handful of stocks that are carrying those indices. This is where I need to remind myself of the big picture and zoom out a little. Since January 2021, our portfolio has returned a decent 40.4%, smashing the NASDAQ's paltry 1.9%. The reason for this outperformance is because of the downward protection a dividend growth portfolio provides that the NASDAQ lacks with its 50% tech weighting. When prices are depressed, we're buying more for our money. And when the dividend is raised, we buy even more for our money. Compare that to a pure growth play and you're not rewarded for holding on tight. 1.9% is a major loss when inflation is factored in from 2021 to mid 2023. Enough about that. We're here for the update. So let's start with VFV, Vanguard's non-hedge S&P 500 index ETF. VFV still makes up 0.2% of our portfolio. It was flat on the month despite Nvidia jumping up 36% along with a few other heavyweights in the index. We still have an allocation target of 5%. With the index heading back towards all time highs, we may have made a mistake holding off and jumping into our position. The index is now trading at a PE of nearly 24.2, up from its low of 18.12 in September of last year. Next, Canoe EIT Income Fund makes up 2.4% of our portfolio. It is down 5% on the month. Its five-year performance has pulled back a little, but it is still very healthy at 13.9%. This still remains on the chopping block as I do not intend to hold this forever. Next up is Fiera Capital. It represents a yucky 2.8% of our portfolio. It finished the month down a whopping 15%. The longer I've held this since wanting to sell, the worse the situation has become, month after month. I sound like a broken record, don't I? Q1 earnings were released and they were okay, but not promising. AUM increased 6 billion in the quarter, but it's still down 10 billion or 5.6% year over year. With this down now 34% since its January high, the yield has gone sky high and the payout ratio is very unhealthy. Next, TD Bank makes up 3.3% of our portfolio. It finished the month down 6% and for a few reasons. Firstly, at the beginning of the month, they pulled out of the 13.4 billion First Horizons deal. TD will pay them 200 million in addition to a $25 million fee reimbursement. Then at the end of the month, TD reported earnings. Here are a few highlights. The bad? EPS was down 4% on an adjusted basis. Net income was down 12%. PCLs or provisions for credit loss was 599 million. They removed the 2% drip discount and TD doesn't expect to meet its midterm adjusted EPS growth target range of seven to 10%. The good? Set one ratio sits at a very healthy 15.3%. Revenue up 10% year over year. Total loans are up 13% the Cohen acquisition closed and they announced a NICIB for up to 30 million common shares. But we're the only bank to not increase its dividend. They usually do so at the end of the year, however. With all that bad news, we bought 12.03 shares at an average cost of $78.77. This added $46.19 to our forward annual dividend income at a yield of 4.9%. If you enjoy these kinds of monthly updates, we'd appreciate a smash of the like button and a comment on the three new stocks we bought. You'll have to stay until the end of the video to see what they are though. If you were on Blossom Social, you would already know. 
It's a free mobile app for DIY Canadian investors. You can interact with like-minded investors and best or worst of all, see all my trades live. Just click the link below. Next up, Algonquin Power and Utilities Corp makes up 4.3% of our portfolio. It was flat on the month. Q1 earnings were released and here are the highlights. Revenue was up 3%, EPS came in at 17 cents, down 19%. Interest expense increased 24 million year over year. And they reiterated estimated 2023 earnings of 55 to 61 cents, US mind you, a share. I am sitting on this to see how they do in the ever increasing interest rate environment. Next, we have Manulife Financial Corporation at 4.6% of our portfolio. It finished the month down 6%. Like most of the companies we own, earnings were released in May and they were okay. Here are my takeaways. Core EPS was up 11% to 79 cents. Dividend payout ratio is sitting at 46% and adjusted book value per common share of $30.04 as of March 31st, 2023, an increase of $2.51 from last year. Next up, at 5.4% of our portfolio, we have BCE Inc. Telecoms have been suffering lately. It's down almost 7% on the month. Q1 earnings were released, and here are some of the noteworthy points. Revenue was up 3.5% year over year. They reconfirmed all 2023 financial guidance targets, and they have a healthy balance sheet with 3.7 billion total available liquidity to support strategic priorities and higher common share dividends in 2023. That's what I really like. Next up we have TELUS Corporation at 5.7% of our portfolio. We still have some buying to do with our telecoms. TELUS is continuing the downtrend, losing 10% on the month. There's a lot of worry about the dividend safety of TELUS as it now yields 5.6%, much higher than its 4.6% average. Q1 earnings were a good indication. Here's the gist. The quarterly dividend was raised. You heard that right. Raised to 36.36 cents a quarter, an increase of 7.4% over the same period last year, or 3.6% over last quarter. That's the 24th increase since May 2011. Operating revenues were up 15% and adjusted EBITDA up 11%. Excluding the effects of their accelerated capital expenditures program of 623 million, for the most recent four quarters anyways, the cash flow payout ratio was 62%, well within their 60 to 75% objective range. We bought 16 shares at an average cost of $26.39. This added $23.26 to our forward annual dividend income at a yield of 5.5%. Next, we have Pembina Pipeline Corp. It represents 5.8% of our portfolio. It lost 7.8% in May as the energy sector continues to get hammered in Canada. Q1 earnings were released and here's my take. About 4 billion of additional projects under development. Guidance was reiterated for 2023, and there was a small 2.3% dividend increase, but an increase nonetheless. And Pembina currently expects excess free cash flow in 2023 to be used to pay down debt, further strengthening the balance sheet. With a drop in price, we bought five shares at a cost of $42.21. This added $13.35 to our annual dividend income at a yield of 6.3%. Next is Fortis, representing 5.9% of our portfolio. It finished the month down 4%, which is good for when I drip a share next month. And guess what guys? Fortis also released Q1 earnings. Man, I had too many reports to read this month. The highlights were nothing too high. Fortis expects its long-term growth and rate base will drive earnings that support dividend growth guidance of 4 to 6% annually through 2027. Nothing new there. Adjusted EPS was 91 cents, up from 78 last year, and Fortis agreed to sell its ownership interest in the Atkin Creek Natural Gas Storage Facility for approximately $400 million to Enbridge. They will use this to strengthen their balance sheet. Next, we have our OG pipeline Enbridge at 6.5% of our portfolio. It traded down 10.8% on the month. Enbridge reported Q1 earnings at the beginning of May. Here's what stood out to me. Earnings were completely flat. DCF was 3.2 billion compared to 3.1 billion last year. As I mentioned, with Fortis, Enbridge purchased a natural gas storage facility. 
We took advantage of the pullback and bought 12 shares at a cost of $50.19. That added $42.60 to our forward annual dividend income at a yield of 7.1%. Next is Smart Center's Real Estate Investment Trust at 6.9% of our portfolio. It lost another 3% this month as the real estate market continues to downtrend. This also reported earnings in May. They were okay, nothing glaringly bad and nothing jaw-droppingly good. Occupancy is still sitting at 98%, payout ratio to AFFO was 93%, and they have 20 projects under development with more than 3 million square feet of principally high-rise residential on existing shopping center sites in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. We took advantage of this decline to add 10.27 shares at a cost of $25.83. That added $19 to our forward annual dividend income at a yield of 7.2%. Next, we have our fifth largest holding, TC Energy Corp, at 7.3% of our portfolio. It is currently our largest energy position. It finished the month down over 6%. It was the least worst performing pipeline of the three. This is now near our book value, and we may add a little if this drops below it. The fundamentals haven't had a change and oil and gas prices really shouldn't have a major impact on pipelines unless volume drastically starts to drop. Our fourth largest holding is First National Financial at 7.9% of our portfolio. It finished the month down 2% after rising 8.5%. These are the massive swings the market has had since COVID. I'm still sitting on the sidelines waiting to increase my position by about 20%. I have full confidence in First National to continue to deliver even in the most challenging real estate markets. Even with the massive pullback in price over the past year, the five-year price CAGR is still sitting at a very healthy 6.9%. Our loved mid-cap utility, Capital Power Corp is our third largest holding at 8.4% of our portfolio. This finished the month flat. It reported earnings at the beginning of May. It was solid and as I expect from them with their history, they confirmed full year AFFO and adjusted EBITDA is trending to the upper end of the annual guidance ranges for 2023. Also, as I mentioned before, Avic Day was appointed as president and CEO. It'll be interesting to see if there are any sweeping changes to how Capital Power is run in the coming quarters as he brings his experience from various positions he's held in the energy sector. We just love Capital Power. Our second largest holding at 8.8% of our portfolio remains Bank of Nova Scotia. It finished the month down 3%. It, like the rest of our portfolio, reported earnings in May. For them, Q2. They weren't as bad as one might have expected given the market climate. Here's some highlights. The dividend was increased 3 cents or 2.9%. EPS down 22% year over year. Net income down 1% year over year. Set one ratio of 12.3%. And is expected to grow through fiscal 2023. Total PCLs were 709 million up from 219 a year ago. Canadian residential mortgages were 36% variable mortgages. We will drip this in July at current prices. And lastly, our largest holding remains RioCan Real Estate Investment Trust. It's 11.9% of our portfolio. It finished the month down over 4%. RioCan is in a similar position to Smart Centers, just with a better balance sheet. Q1 looked like this in May. FFO per unit was 4.8% higher than the same period last year. Book value is sitting at $25.83. For 2023, they forecasted FFO per unit to be within the range of $1.77 to $1.80. That's awesome. Same property NOI up 4.5% year over year, and FFO payout ratio is sitting at just over 59%. We were able to drip three shares at a price of $20.70 at the beginning of the month. This added $3.24 to our forward annual income at a yield of 5.2%. And now, if you stuck it out until now or you just skipped using the chapters, that's why they're there. Here's our three new holdings. First, we added back into the portfolio Canadian National Railway, CNR. It makes up a tiny 0.4% of our portfolio. I've been waiting a long time to jump back into one of my favorite industrials. We bought three shares at a cost of a dollar, not a dollar, a hundred and fifty-three dollars and fifty-nine cents a share. This added nine dollars and forty-eight cents to our annual dividend income at a yield of two point one percent. Next, we added back into the portfolio Go Easy Financial. It is also 0.4 percent of our portfolio. This was always meant to replace Fiera. In hindsight, I should have sold all of our Fiera holdings back in September and kept Go Easy. 
there's really no point looking in the rear view mirror all the time. We bought four shares at a cost of $91.67. This added $15.36 to our annual dividend income at a yield of 4.2%. I wish I had more cash to buy 20 times as much at that price. And lastly, we added Brookfield Corporation. It represents 1.4% of our portfolio. We bought 41 shares at a cost of $41.49. This added $15.50 to our forward yearly dividend income at a yield of 0.9%. Did you guess all three right? I don't think many saw us pulling the trigger on Brookfield Corp given how exposed they are to real estate. Are you curious why we bought this holding company? Let me know in the comments below if you wanna see a video on it. So there you have it, all 20 holdings we own and what stocks we added in May. We deployed a total of $5,039.21, adding $187.98 to our forward annual dividend income this month at an average yield of 3.7%. If you watched our May income update, you will notice that we deployed 25 times as much cash as we had income from the portfolio. We still have a lot of work to do with about 52 k in TFSA contribution room. Thank you so much for watching and helping the channel out by smashing that like and subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Mr. Financial.